everywhere I go, people are praying for revival. Don't stop. Don't stop. Some see revival, or actually more accurately, a Holy Spirit awakening that is needed because our world has been sliding into moral abyss. They're praying for a revival because they feel that our culture is becoming darker and darker. They pray before, for revival because they see society moving down a slippery slope of self-destruction. Question, why hasn't God answered our prayer? I know you're thinking for some answers in your head. That's good, because that's what I want you to think about. So many saints across the country, across the world are praying for a revival. Why hasn't God answered? Now, there are some foolish people who really think that we can manufacture a revival. They really do. That we can gen it up. Others think that if you get 50,000 people in a stadium who sing and dance for Jesus, <laughs> that's going to bring about the revival. Well, recently I have been meditating in the scripture about a man who was not only praying for a revival in his time, he was actually demanding a revival from God. I want to show you in a minute. So cocky he was in the beginning of his book, so cocky, that he could not understand why God is not answering something that is good for him. <laughs> in fact, far from answering his prayer for revival, far from even saying to Habakkuk, I've heard your prayer for revival, God was planning a calamity. Listen, if you came here looking for a feel-good message, this is it. <laughs> this is it. It's been the burden of my heart. I was going to call this message when God says no, but then I thought better of it when God's plan differ from ours in timing, in timing. So if you, this wonderful prayer that was read to us so ably today, Habakkuk 3, 1 to 19, is very significant. Mark it in your Bible. Open it, hope that you've opened to Habakkuk already. But mark that prayer, that's a very significant prayer. But I'm actually, as Jonathan said, I'm going to go through the entire book in 20 minutes. So fasten your seat belts, because if you blink, you're going to miss what I'm going to say. In fact, every time I think of why God's plan differ from ours, why God's timing differ from ours, and not all the time, God answers prayer immediately. I've been the recipient of amazing quick answers to prayer, but then there are times I waited for years, and, and so that God it just does his thing, and, and, and he listens, and he hears our prayer, but I often think, whenever I think of that, I think of a man by the name of William Cowper. William Cowper lived in London, England between 1731 and 1800. Just think about that. He was a well-known poet and a hymn writer, and he actually one of uh, John Newton's closest friends, the man who was a slave trader, turned to write this magnificent song that the sung the world over, Amazing Grace. He was a close friend of John Newton. But Cowper struggled with depression and mental illness. Listen to me, please. There is nothing wrong when you suffer some mental illness. 
There is nothing wrong with being depressed. Some of the great men of God have suffered from depression. Charles Spurgeon has written a whole chapter in his lecture to my students about that experience. Church used to send him to France uh, three months at a time to get out of his depression. He was haunted. This man of God who wrote some of the most amazing hymns, he was haunted by this persistent notion that God does not love him. Despite his deep desire to love God and to follow God and to obey Christ and his word, that feeling persisted. Though he knew and he believed the promises of God that are in the word of God, and yet that feeling of despair just continued. On several occasions, he attempted suicide. He was institutionalized between 1763 and 1765. That's almost two years. And if you read anything about those days, institutionalizing, it's not like what we do have now, thank God. After his release from being institutionalized, he took comfort in plunging into prayer and scripture and spending time with wonderful Christian friends, long talks. And yet from time to time, he was plagued by doubts that led him to suicidal thoughts. Well, one day on a shrouded, uh, imperitable fog in London, and if you've ever seen that, you'll understand. Sometimes I think that in itself, because of depression, <laughs> they, they, they have even a brand of a, a coat called La London Fog. <laughs> and, and, and it can be really depressing. Well, one night when that fog just settled on the city of London, and he was so depressed, he was just wanted to take his own life, he decided to just end it all. So he went outside and he called the coach. You know, back then, of course, taxis were horse and buggies. And, 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 and so he calls that driver and, he, and, and the driver comes in and, and, and he gets in that coach and he says to the driver, take me to the London Bridge. He was going to jump into the River Thames and end it all. He wanted to give peace to his tortured soul. The coachman drove Coper through the dense fog in search of the bridge. And he became totally and completely and hopelessly disoriented. The driver did. And he kept going and kept going, couldn't find the bridge. And finally, out of frustration, Coper said, stop. I'm going to go out and I'm going to find it on foot. And so he gets out of the coach and he stands there trying to get his bearing and see where he is, and he was right in front of his house. (laughs) The driver in the fog has been going around and around and around in circles and didn't realize it. Immediately, Cowper realized God's hand. He saw God's hand that has guided him to the very doorstep of his house. And so Cowper, who had been brooding and and thinking that God did not love him, here he is, standing in the front door of his house with absolutely clear proof that God loves him more than he could imagine. And this was God's way of reaching to him and saying, William, I love you. I love you. Kalpa then decided to live for God instead of dying in self-pity. So he immediately went into his desk and he began to compose this well-known hymn that sung in the church of Jesus Christ across the world for 200 years. And I'm so glad our team put a a, 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 a wonderful, fresh music to it, and they're going to be singing it after the message. God moves 
in mysterious ways. His wonder to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides through the storm. Don't, please, please don't ask me, why does God allow mental illness among some of his great saints? The reason I ask you not to ask me because I don't know. It's the absolute truth. But I know this. I know this for sure. That God loves them more than they can imagine. More than they can imagine. Listen to me. In times when our prayers go unanswered, or when God delays his answer, or when our pleas with heaven seems to bounce off like a leaden sky, or when you receive the answer to prayer that is the opposite of what you're praying for, you can sink deep into discouragement. Or you can do what Habakkuk did. He learned to grow in intimacy with God. Habakkuk received a total different response from God to what he prayed for. But, here's what I want you to think. Please think with me. I don't want to do the thinking for you. I want you to think with me, okay? Habakkuk responds to this delay in prayer. Habakkuk responds to this unanswered prayer is the most important thing I can share with you today. Instead of being angry with God, as some do, instead of developing that cold love toward God, instead of uh, stop praying altogether, and this is really the good news, and that's what I meant you're gonna be, if you're looking for feel good, this is gonna feel good because you're also gonna help you think good. (laughs) Habakkuk turned his unanswered prayer into an opportunity to grow in his faith, to grow in his trust, to grow in his knowledge of God, in intimacy with God. Habakkuk used this opportunity to uh, turn the disappointment uh, into an opportunity for growing and knowing the will of God and aligning his will, God's will, his will with God's will. Now, beloved, this is a vitally important lesson. It really is. I cannot overemphasize the importance of this. Don't miss it. See, the Word of God gives us several reasons throughout the Scripture about why sometimes our prayers are not answered. These are biblical reasons, and, and I'm going to share just some samples with you. But, but that's not what is the case here. But I'm just going to give you this, so I'm sure I'm covering the subject. Uh, For example, James in chapter 1, verses 6 and 7 tells us that sometimes our prayers are not answered because we're not expecting an answer. The Lord Jesus Christ tells us in Luke 18, he says sometimes prayers are not answered because we do not persist in prayer. Uh, in the Psalm 66, I've been reading through it. Some of you read through the Daily Chronological Bible. I've been doing this now for 26 years. And, and right now, I have just read like yesterday, Psalm 66, verse 18. It says, when I cherish a sin in my heart, God will not answer me. That is, if I have an unconfessed sin, a sin that I cherish in my heart, that I love and keep on loving, then my prayers will not answer. As I said, these are just samples of what the Scripture talks about, but that's not the issue here. That is not the issue here. You see, when you know that your prayer is consistent with the Word of God, when you know that your prayer is consistent with the will of God, that is really the issue. It's not that you're doing any of these things that I just shared. Please listen to me. What can be more consistent with the word of God than prayer for revival. What can be more consistent, right? I mean, are you with me? Thank you. But before I get to that, let me tell you about the very little we know about Habakkuk. I mean, we know so little about this guy. Uh, Prophet of God except that he lived 
during the reign of King Jehoiakim. Now, before you get so underwhelmed by that information, <laughs> um, there's a meaning, there's a reason for it. That is, that's the time immediately before the Babylonians coming in and ransacking Israel and taking people captives into Babylon. Just, that's all you need to know. Three chapters in that book. And basically, it's a dialogue between Habakkuk and the Lord. He's going back and forth. He's talking to the Lord. In the beginning of his dialogue, Habakkuk, look, I mean, I got to tell you, if you read it carefully in, I read it actually in more than one language, but he's very condescending. Have you ever seen people condescending in their prayer? Oh, my goodness. I saw a man was trotting around and said, Lord, I want you to do it this way, and I want you to do it when I want you to do it. I was, this is several years ago, and I just sat and wept for that man. It was very condescending. In verse 2 of chapter 1, how long am I going to wait? Well, you know, how long are you going to keep me waiting, God? Why don't you do this? <laughs> Why are you not listening to me? In fact, Habakkuk was baffled by God's answer. He was baffled, demanding that God must obey him and do what he tells him. Oh, but I want you to listen to what God said, okay? Just listen to what God said in verse 5 and 6. Oh, Habakkuk, I'm going to do some things that you would not believe if I told you. Ooh, goody! He's going to do far more exceedingly abundantly than what I'm asking for. Wrong. Wrong. Not a chance. It was not what Habakkuk is asking for. God said, if it is a revival you are praying for, you're going to have to wait. If it is a certain blessing that you are asking for, you have to wait. What is God saying? What does God say? Listen to me. God was going to answer Habakkuk's prayer, but not in the way he's expecting it, and not in the time that Habakkuk is demanding it. What is God saying? God is saying, I heard your prayer. I will respond to you, please, but not yet. Not yet. Right now, I'm raising a pagan and brutal people. I'm raising bloodthirsty people. I'm raising the Babylonians, and they're going to come, and they will take Israel into exile in Babylon. <laughs> Please hear me right. Uh, I'd always tell you if I have my thoughts, or thus says the Lord, I, I don't... <laughs> You can be sure I never confuse myself with the Lord, okay? I never confuse myself with the Word of God. I always make sure you understand that this is, I'm saying this. I have a hunch. It's just a hunch. With that, when Habakkuk heard those words from the Lord, he probably said, what have I done? What have I done? But it's not about you, Habakkuk. It's not about you. That's not what I prayed for. That's not what I'm looking for. I did not pray that. I didn't pray that my people be conquered and carried into foreign land. That is not what I prayed for. How can a merciful God do this to his people? How can a loving God allow wicked people to punish his own people? Second chapter. I told you I'm going to move fast. Second chapter, Habakkuk responds, second complaint. But God said to him, oh, by the way, before you forget, I want you to write it down. Verse 2, 2-2. Two, two. <laughs> write this revelation, write it down, write down the prophecy. I don't want to ever be forgotten because I have people in Atlanta, Georgia, in the Church of the Apostles on the 21st century, they need to read this. <laughs> What is it? Oh, there is an impending doom. Oh, God, but why? 
because my people have been unfaithful to me for over 200 years. And I've been speaking to them by prophet and a prophet and other prophets because my people have compromised my truth because my people have become idolaters because my people need to repent and turn to me once again. And I can't get their attention. I've done everything possible to get their attention. I can't get their attention. Oh, but there's some good news, some good news. In this word, the Lord gave Habakkuk some good news. Not everyone in Israel will be destroyed or carried into exile. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. Not everyone. So in chapter 2, verse 4, and if you have your Bible, have your own Bible, underline it. Underline it until you rip the paper. <laughs> just, just mark it in every way you can. I'm going to tell you why this is significant. Chapter 2, verse 4. The righteous will live by faith. Let's say that together. Many of you know this. This verse, the righteous shall live by faith, is the verse that ignited the Protestant Reformation. That verse, repeated in Romans, in fact, repeated in the New Testament, is ignited the entire Reformation movement in the 1500s. Oh my God, use it again. To ignite a great awakening. May he use it again. Question, what is God saying to the faithful remnant? The faithful remnant, let me repeat that a third time. The faithful remnant in Israel. Here's what God is saying. No matter how dark it gets, no matter how severe the pain, no matter how difficult the road ahead, no matter how many challenges you may face, no matter what the future brings, no matter what suffering lies ahead, no matter what the economy does, no matter what politicians foolishly do or don't do, I am not only in control of history, but I'm the watcher over my faithful people. This is crucial, don't miss it. I believe the Lord wants all of his faithful people, those who are watching around the world and those in this Beautiful sanctuary. He wants all these faithful people. I believe with all my heart. This is not a word from Michael. It's a word from the word of God. God wants all his faithful people to hear and heed his word. When we cry to God, God, these evil and wicked people appearing to be succeeding. Oh Lord, the foundation structure of society is crumbling. Oh God, how long must we cry out for help? God, do you care about the blood shedding of millions of babies in their mother's womb? God, do you care about the indoctrination in immorality in our schools? God, do you care about the wicked prospering? God's answer to Habakkuk of old is for us. Here's what God is basically saying. You are asking the wrong question. You're asking the wrong questions. I have asked those those words that came out of my mouth when I pray. So I'm not saying, I'm not pointing finger. I'm telling you what I have prayed. And just as God told Habakkuk, he's praying the wrong prayers, he's asking the wrong questions, I felt that sting of the rebuke in those words of the scripture. Lord, what is the right question? What are the right questions? The right question is to ask yourself, not God, yourself. What is God saying to us? 
What is God teaching us? Here it is. Is there something in my own life that I need to deal with? Is there sin of apathy in my life that I need to repent of? Do I need to grow my faith in my walk with the Lord? Do I need to mature in my knowledge of the Word of God and the character of God and the nature of God? Is there something I need to do? That's very different. When we just say, God, do it, God, do it, God, do it. God will answer. Instead of blaming God, you need to start praising God. <laughs> Point a finger at you and praise God. Let's, let's go through the motion like this. Point a finger at you and praise God. Please listen to me. I'm going to put my foot in it today. And I'm telling you, I'm, I'm too old to worry about how, how many feelings are going to be hurt. People have their feelings hurt very easily. Even when Twitter's sold, they cry. <laughs> That's the culture we live in. <laughs> Listen to me. When God permits the barbarians to be in charge of our government as they do now. He wants us not to blame him, but to grow closer to him. He wants us not to pout and point at God, but to point a finger at us, what am I doing? He wants us not to feel sorry for ourselves, but to purify ourselves. And that is why chapter 3, I told you I'm going to move through the three chapters. <laughs> the last chapter, you see Habakkuk gets it. He really gets it. I don't know how long it took. I've only given you 20 minutes, and I think you got it. I'm, I'm having faith that you got it. <laughs> but Habakkuk gets it. He gets it in the... Proof is in chapter 3. Lord, I've heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deed, your deeds. Lord, repeat them in our day. In our time, make them known. And please, in wrath, Remember mercy. Beloved, Habakkuk is saying, in effect, in the past you did great things. Do them again. Please understand. Please understand. It is never wrong to pray for revival. It is never wrong. If you misunderstand me, then it's your fault. <laughs> it is never wrong to pray for revival. I'm encouraged by people praying for a revival. So the question is, did God want Israel to have a revival? Absolutely. Does God want us to have a revival? Without a question. Without a question. Without a question. Then why the delay answer to Habakkuk's prayer for revival and to our prayer? That question really puzzled Habakkuk. It, it puzzled him. Why is our prayer for revival not being answered? And the reason for Habakkuk's puzzlement is ours. My people have demoted me. What? My people have demoted me. Look at the average evangelical church. I'm not talking about mainline churches. I'm talking about evangelical churches today. Pastors are falling like flies. Michael, how in the world I can demote God? How in the world I have, a, I have never abandoned God? I'm in church, aren't I? At least those of you are here.
First of all, let me go back to the book of Habakkuk, okay? During that time, they viewed the God of heaven and earth, Yahweh, the God who did all these great things in the past. They viewed him as the chief deity in a pantheon of many deities. In Habakkuk's day, the people of God demote God just like our generation does. They said, as we say, see how we worship God on a regular basis? We go to church. I read the Bible. Sure. But what is really preoccupying your mind and your thought and your time and your energy 24-7? God, first and foremost, yes, absolutely. God is my number one priority. Listen to me. (laughs) That would be like a husband who would be saying to his wife, Oh, I have not abandoned you. I've not abandoned you. I've never betrayed you. Sure, I have all these other girlfriends. (laughs) But you're the one. I married you. I love you. I think this is an apt analogy because the Bible actually relates idolatry to spiritual adultery. Read the book of Hosea. I want to tell you three things that Habakkuk learned that they stand out. No, 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 that's not a three-point sermon. No, relax. It's just three things I want to share very quickly. Three lessons that Habakkuk learned from all this experience. Share them with you as I come toward the end. Three things. Humility, adoration, concentration, or focus. Humility, adoration, and concentration. You see, between chapter one and chapter three, Habakkuk did 180 degrees. He did a 180 degree turn. He really did. Between chapter one and chapter three, don't miss it, don't miss it. Because something drastic happened in the life of God's man Habakkuk between chapter one and chapter three. He started by saying, God, where are you? Why are you not answering me? Why are you not answering my prayer? How long am I going to keep on waiting? What happened? Something wonderful happened. And I pray to God what happened to all of us. I know, I pray to God that what happened to me. He learned to shift his mind from all of the problems and focus on the glory of God. Can I get an amen? Amen. He took his eyes, because what happened, Habakkuk was looking looking at God through the wrong end of the telescope. Have you ever done that? Have you ever done that? He was looking, he turned the telescope around and he was looking at the wrong end. And God said, turn it the right way. (laughs) You're looking at the wrong end of the telescope. You see, what you see when you look at the wrong end of the telescope to God, you're going to see God to be unfair, unjust, uncaring. But once you stop listening to all the bad news on cable television, once you take your eyes off of who's in and who's out, once you take your eyes off who is uh, uh, doing what, and who is not doing what? Once you fix your eyes squarely on the righteousness and the majesty of God, once you focus on the glory of God, everything else faded away into insignificance. Now, beloved, God wants to see broken, brokenness and humility. Not how much better we are what we're doing for God, and look at this and look at that. No, 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 no. He wants to see personally. Personal repentance instead of self-righteousness. Please listen to me. 
how we approach God, I'm going to repeat this, how we approach God will determine the effectiveness of our prayer. I'm going to repeat this. How we approach God will determine the effectiveness of our prayer. So it's humility, not entitlement that God responds to. Secondly, adoration. The second feature of the effectiveness prayer of Habakkuk that he learned is adoration. Adoration is the expression of our love for the Lord in prayer. Let me ask you this. How many times have you just spent time in the presence of God asking for another blessed thing? Asking nothing. Just pouring your love on Him. Pouring your love on Him. Don't raise your hand. Throughout chapter 3, I cannot help but feel the emotion of adoration and awe of Habakkuk. I was not in the early part. Adoration of God's righteousness, God's power, God's past deliverance, God's glory, and God, what God has done for his people. Adoration and awe of God's past deeds. Adoration and awe, and awe of his glory and everlasting nature. Adoration and awe of his power that eclipses the sun and the moon. Habakkuk is not only amazed at God's power, but he's captivated by God's righteousness. Hmm. Beloved, I, I can tell you this on the authority of the scripture. There can be no effective prayer without understanding who God really is. It's not just someone you go to every time you need something. And what it means to pray to him, to pray to the God of the universe. Most Christians, honestly, in our West anyway, have such superficial knowledge of who God is. Oh, they know all the right doctrine, they know the trend, they know the cross, they know all that. But they expect him to do what they want him to do when they ask him to do it. My beloved friends, listen to me. To enter into the very heart of God is to open your heart to him and pour out your love for him and recognize his worth, his worth. In fact, the word worship comes from worship in the Latin, showing God his worth. What is he worth to you? When we delight ourselves in the Lord, we become overwhelmed and we get to think of amazing blessings that protection of the past, only then can we find ourselves delighting in what delights his heart. Delight ourselves in what, he, what, what delights him. Humility, adoration, and thirdly, focus or concentration. Concentration and focus on what God loves, on what God loves. Habakkuk was asking God to send the revival and questioning why he's not doing this. But in reality, God is saying, Habakkuk, for 200 years, I've been pleading with my people. Read Hosea, read Isaiah, read Jeremiah, re read the prophets. Again and again and again pleading with his people to repent and turn to him that they would not. They stubbornly refuse. And therefore, they will not receive a revival, but judgment. Oh my goodness, that's like a knife in my heart. <laughs> I don't want judgment, do you? No, none of us do. Habakkuk didn't want judgment. He wants a revival. <laughs> I do too. I want a revival, not judgment. 
What's revival? Well, revival means to make something alive. Uh, revive something is, is, is to make, a, a, make it alive after being dead. Again, I said earlier, some foolish people think that we can gin, we can manufacture revival, we can make it happen. That's not what the Bible means by revival at all. We can get emotional meetings. See, when the spiritually dead become alive through the power of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit alone, that is a true revival. And that's what happened here. Once Habakkuk took his eyes off of the spiritual problem that plaguing the nation, that he thought a revival can come and take care of this and solve the problems, whether it be our economic problems or our social problems, our moral problems, and God can just give us some good conservative people, get in government power, and then we, everything will be okay. That's what they pray for, revival. That's not the, this is something you and I must do, roll our sleeves and go out and get involved. Vote for God's sake. There's some Christians don't vote. But once he took his eyes off the spiritual problem and he focused on the glory of God, he saw even the Babylonian exile to be God's plan for a revival. Because revival happened after the exile. Remember with Nehemiah and Ezra and a revival came in Israel? History has shown us again and again, I'm getting ready to close. History has shown us again and again, study history. Before the Protestant Reformation in the 1500s, the church was dark and dead. In fact, that's what we call the dark ages. Pope Alexander VI filled the Vatican with his illegitimate children. And he used to display them proudly in public. And I'm not going to get into more details because it's really depressing and revolting. And, but, but think of the corruption and the superstition beyond description. And when God raised Martin Luther and he started reading the scripture and he read Habakkuk 2.4, the righteous shall live by faith, God put in motion and ignited the revival that started in the Reformation and that took us from the dark ages to civilization. I'm absolutely convinced that Western civilization sits on one thing, and that's the Protestant Reformation. Because it went back to the Word of God. Oh, but not before a whole lot of pain. I wish it wasn't, but it was. A lot of pain. Fast forward 200 years in America. Society was steeped in spiritual darkness. Sexual immorality was rampant. The family was broken down. And God raised a handful of believers who sought the glory of God. They sought the majesty of God. And that was paramount, not the social ills, not the moral problems, but the glory of God more than anything else. And God raised Jonathan Edwards and did the first great awakening in America, but not before a whole lot of pain. In England itself, things were so bad. It was so bad. Every second house was called a, a grog shop, or grog is a slang for alcohol. Every second house. Drunkenness was epidemic, and sexual immorality was a commonplace, so much so that kids did not know who their fathers were. But God moved in the heart of Whitfield and the two Wesley brothers who sought the glory of God first and foremost. And God used these three to transform England. Secular historians that I've studied in my years in university have said that that revival that saved England from the horrors of the French Revolution. Oh, there's some benefit, yes, but the glory of God was paramount but not before a whole lot of pain. How many times Whitfield and John Wesley got stoned and bled? Similar things were happening in 1850, and God raised up a businessman by the name of Jeremiah Lamphere, 
who sought the glory of God above all else. And God again changed America. But not before a whole lot of pain. And so my beloved friends, my beloved friends, wanting a revival to solve our nation's moral troubles is very different from wanting a revival for the glory of God. Can you see the difference? Some of you probably say, well, what difference does it make? Yes, it does make a whole lot of difference. You see, our motives, it makes a difference. Do you want to see Jesus glorified? Do you want to see Jesus glorified? Do you want to see the glory of God? Or do you just want to solve some of the problems we have? Bad as they are. You see, when God is glorified, the problems will take care of itself. So don't put the cart before the horse. It's the glory of God. It's the glory of God. It's the glory of God. Not our moral problems. Listen to me. What if we are told by God? I did not want to really put this, write these words down, but I did. What if you, what if we hear from God as a nation and as people, God's people, that before revival comes, there's going to be a severe judgment coming. I wonder how we react. Would we get closer to him? May everyone at the sound of my voice begin praying for the glory of God. The glory of God. God for your majesty, for your glory, for your splendor, for your name, above all else. That's all we seek. And oh Lord, whatever else you do, we trust you. We trust you. Habakkuk last word says, look, if if things are so bad that there's no food, there's no, I mean, that's their economy, basically, the agricultural economy. So he's n- naming all the trees and all the sheep and, the, and, and, and animals and, and, and the economy. He said, even though it's collapsing, I'm still going to trust you. Hallelujah. I'm still going to trust you. Because you said, the righteous shall live by faith. Let me hear you say it. Lord, I'm just so overwhelmed. When I stand here before your people and open my heart and and cry to you, knowing what your word said, I just join with so many faithful people, faithful remnants throughout the land and elsewhere in the world, in England and Australia and people in Canada, I, I know so many of them have signed up to pray for an awakening. For Father, we pray that we would pray with the right attitude. We're not just praying so you can solve the problems for us. But Lord, we want to see Jesus. We want to see Jesus who is reviled and cursed in public be honored and glorified. Father, may this be the longing of our hearts, the motivation for living, the motivation for the use of our time, our talent, our treasure. For, oh, Father, we know that there is power in the name of Jesus. There's power in the name of Jesus. And it is in that name that I pray. And all of God's people said amen.